Hey guys, if, if you wind up liking this talk, I'm gonna be tweeting out links to slides and all that stuff uh, later, so check out my Twitters. Um, so I'm very excited to be here, right? I, I come down to San Francisco every couple of, or a couple times a year, and every time I come in, I always feel like I'm, I'm like flying into Starfleet Academy. You know, SFO is really aluminum and roundy and everything's from the future and the sky's clear. And then I go back home to Seattle and it's just, it's a whole different story. Little known fact, that's actually a young Aaron Patterson. <laughs> so uh, my talk is about the short but happy lives of HTTP requests, and specifically with a specific focus on how to make those uh, shorter. Um, we all know how this works, right? You type in a URL into your browser. Um, that triggers your Rails controller, which causes a view to be rendered, which causes a nice picture of a calming manatee to be rendered back to the browser. And so, you know, that's great. That's, that's a mental model I, I kind of use when I'm, I'm developing. But if you've been at this a while, you might start to notice that this connection between the uh, browser and the, the controllers and the views is a little bit mysterious. It's, it's kind of like a black box. And if we're going to build fast performant web applications, we kind of need to know what's in that black box. Uh, I like to think it's full of manatees, but that's just me. Um, so let's talk about the internet. As soon as you... <laughs> I was like, you got 28 more minutes of this. <laughs> as, soon as, you, as soon as you start to research the network, uh, try and learn about this stuff, you run into this thing called the OSI model. It's, uh, it's very simple. Uh, <laughs> there's actually a lot of, of dispute about the OSI model. Some people think it looks like a hamburger. At, uh, at this moment in time, though, we're all pretty much in agreement that it's made out of cats. Because, I mean, how else could the internet be so efficient in transmitting pictures of cats? Uh, so, so to find an image of the OSI model that didn't involve some stupid meme, I actually had to go back to a, a 1995 issue of Dr. Dobbs' journal and scan in a picture. And so what you see here is we've, we've got a 10,000 foot view of the network stack. Um, at the top, we have things that are more abstract. At the bottom, we have things that are less abstract. Uh, you and I are used to dealing with the application and presentation layers. Um, let's just go down the stack. The session layers, kind of like uh, SSL, transport and network are kind of TCP IP, and the data link and physical are kind of like uh, Ethernet card and the wire. Right? So I want to talk for a second about wires. It, it turns out that wires are surprisingly important to modern web development. Be because your wire determines your latency. And latency is the time that it takes for one byte of information to travel from my computer to your computer. It's the time in the wire, right? It's not bandwidth. It's not measured in megabits per second. It's measured in milliseconds. And the thing to know about latency is that it's got a lower bound. It's got, it's got a lower bound determined by the speed of light, right? Which is great, because the speed of light is like, it's like the fastest thing in the world. It's 300 million meters per second uh, is the speed of light in a vacuum. And, and just like a little pro tip for you guys who didn't go to science school like I did, uh, just call it the speed of light in a vacuum. Don't say SOL in a vacuum, because that's like something completely different. Um, <laughs> but you run into problems when you actually, uh, say, calculate the shortest distance between London and New York City, or New York City and London. Uh, when you do this, you find it's about five and a half million meters. And do the math, that means that your minimum theoretical latency uh, round trip between New York City and London is 37 milliseconds, roughly. So you're never going to send a message uh, to, from, from New York City to London and get it back in less than 30, 32 milliseconds, or 37 milliseconds. And in fact, it's, it's, it's a lot shorter than that because we're not sending light through a vacuum. We're sending it through fiber. And, and light travels through fiber much sl more slowly than it does through a vacuum. So we find out that we have uh, latencies that are kind of like this, right? Uh, New York City to London is about 70, 
uh, 79.6 milliseconds. That's, that's really too precise. Let's say 70 to 90 milliseconds. Within the US, latencies uh, of about 40 milliseconds are common. Uh, Japan, you got 16 millisecond latency. It's not because they're super highly advanced. It's because, well, the country is a lot smaller. And I bring this up because latency kills user experience. Right? If, if I click on a button and it takes 100 milliseconds for something to happen, I know in my heart of hearts that I didn't really cause that thing to happen physically. <laughs> and if it takes 200 milli 50 milliseconds, it, it, it feels sluggish. If it takes 500 milliseconds, I'm wondering how the stock market's doing. Um, yeah, I just started investing in the stock market. I'm like $50 down. Uh, 1,000 milliseconds, I'm out of there, right? Uh, and this has real world, world impl yeah, real world implications because uh, Google found that if searches took longer than 400 milliseconds, people didn't search as much. Uh, big online retailers have done studies that show a correlation between conversion rate and latency. So how do you get rid of latency? There's an easy way, which is to move your servers closer to your users. And that's why we use CDNs, uh, content delivery networks. But you can't really do that for everything, right? Chances are you have a centralized database, you have you know, this centralized infrastructure, and it would be really a pain in the neck to duplicate that all over the world and keep those in sync. And so we're going to talk about the, the slightly harder task of eliminating round trips. Now, before we do this, I, I've sort of dissed on, on bandwidth a little bit. I haven't really talked about bandwidth. And I, I want to do that for a second. And to do that, we've got, we got to go into the data link I, this is the creepiest picture I could find. Uh, <laughs> the data link is, is, is your Ethernet card. It's like your, your, your cable connection, right? And it determines your bandwidth. And bandwidth has to be super important, right? Because these cable companies spend millions of dollars trying to convince us that life at 10 megabits per second is at least 10 times better than life at 1 megabit per second. Only it turns out it's, that's just a lie. Um, some smart people at Google have done studies measuring real-life page load times as a function of both bandwidth and latency. And they found that after you hit about 3 or 4 megabits per second, you get diminishing returns. Uh, adding more bandwidth doesn't significantly increase uh, page uh, or decrease page load time. However, uh, page load time decreases linearly as a function of latency. And so if nothing else, this slide will save you, you know, $30, $40, $50 a month, call your cable company, downgrade your plan. But why is this the case? Well, it has to do with the way that the, the internet has evolved, the, the way we use the network has evolved, right? Uh, I, I just loaded up uh, Slate.com, and Slate on his homepage makes 286 requests for 1.9 megabytes of data. Like this, this is the web we have now. We make a ton of requests for a tiny bit of data, and it turns out that lots of small files are a lot slower to download than one big file um, over HTTP. So, so why is that the case? It, it's, it's kind of the case because, well, because of the way the protocols interact with one another, the way that HTTP uses TCP. And so let's blame the protocols for a second. Um, I'm just going to run down the stack. You guys already know this, but the, the viewers at home probably don't. So uh, We have IP. The IP protocol just routes packets between computers. It doesn't make any guarantees of uh, delivery or order uh, or anything like that. And so we have TCP, which is an abstraction of a, of a stable network that runs on top of this unstable network, IP. And it guarantees delivery. It guarantees uh, delivery in order. Uh, it's all about reliability. And finally, we have HTTP, which is what we use to uh, request and manipulate files over TCP. And so HTTP um, 1.4 uh, sort of fundamentally is inefficient in the way that it uses TCP. And, and now we're coming to one of the big things. If, if you don't remember anything from this talk, just remember that new TCP connections are expensive. The reason for this is that, well, in order to be super reliable, TCP is also a lot more chatty than, uh, than other protocols. 
For example, uh, when you open a TCP connection, you have this thing called a two-way handshake that happens. Uh, your client says, hey, server, we should talk. The server says, all right, sure, I'm fine with talking. The client says, all right, I see that you're fine with talking. Um, let's continue to talk, and I would like to uh, see that funny cat picture now. So now we've got this, this connection established. And the good, the good news is that you don't need to know about any of this to, to do your job as a web developer. Um, but there is one thing you need to know about this, and that is that you have just incurred one round trip of connection overhead uh, just, to, just to start up this connection. Um, and if you're dealing with a latency of 100 milliseconds, you just added 100 milliseconds of, uh, of time to your, to your load time. And maybe this would be OK. Maybe we could handle this if there were just one extraneous round trip overhead per new connection. But you're not getting off that easy, because there's this thing called congestion control. It's a very complicated subject. And so I'm just going to skip over most of it and tell you the one thing that, that you really need to know. And that is about the uh, slow start process. Because just a second ago, when I, I established that connection with the server and asked for the, the picture of the cat, the server now has a problem. You see, it doesn't know anything about me. It doesn't know anything about how fast my connection is and how much data it can send me at once. If it sends me the whole picture at once, that could wind up overwhelming my network, and all those packets would get dropped, and now I'd have to re-request them. If it sends me too little at once, then it's not using you know, my pipes to, to full efficiency. And so what it does is it kind, of like, it kind of like dips its toe in the water. It sends out a little bit of data at first, maybe one kilobyte or something. And if I receive that and I say, hey, that's great, I got that, then next time it'll send two kilobytes, and then next time four. And it's going to keep going until uh, packets start getting dropped. And then it's going to back off and say, OK, now I know what, what rate I can send this data to this, this person at. You know, which is great. It makes sense, but if you believe this graph, uh, we just incurred 10 round trips to transfer about 250 uh, kilobytes of data. And that's, that's 400 milliseconds if you assume a 40 millisecond latency. Now, this is, this is an example. It's a little bit exaggerated. But still, uh, new TCP connections are super expensive. So we're going to focus on avoiding them, right? HTTP from even version 1.0 has this uh, concept called keep alive. Um, that is where the browser opens a single connection and then uses it for multiple requests. Like I, I request a web page from a, a server. I make a, a connection to that server. And then that same TCP connection is used to send me the HTTP or to, yeah, the HTML. It's used to send me maybe some images, some other assets. And so we get to do multiple HTTP requests um, with only one startup penalty. Um, but there's a couple, there's a couple of ways you can, sh you can get shot in the foot with this, uh, because your server controls keep alive. Uh, and it's possible that perhaps if you have a, a lightly loaded um, server and your users are uh, staying on your site for a long time, there's lots of, of back and forth between your users and your servers, perhaps you would want to extend the keep alive period. If you have a really heavily loaded server, um, you maybe want to shorten that to, to reduce uh, like memory usage by your server. And Apache and Nginx uh, behave uh, sort of fundamentally differently uh, when you deal with lots of connections open. So just, just be aware of that. That's why I'm giving you links and not telling you actually what to do, because I don't, wanna, I don't want you to blame me when you screw it up. So, but, but here, I'll, I'll, I'll give you one, one actual concrete suggestion. That most network stacks uh, have this feature called um, slow start after idle. And what this means is that your network stack is going to monitor open TCP connections. And if it sees that those connections aren't used in the past half a second, one second, it's going to uh, require that the next, the next request that comes over that connection do this whole slow start process again. And that just defeats the whole purpose of your keep alive. And so the first command here is to check to see if you have this enabled. And the second command is to uh, disable it. So try that out. 
Also, don't blame me if it, if it goes wrong. So there's lots of ways you, you can tune your, your TCP stack. I'm not going to talk about any of them, because as long as you don't have a super uh, high network traffic site uh, and you're running a recent version of the Linux kernel, you're going to do fine. Uh, they've, they've done a really good job there. So at this point, you may be wondering, like, HTTP, WTF, like, why is it so inefficient? And you, you've got to cut them a little bit of slack, because originally HTTP was was intended to be sort of a protocol where you could telnet into a server and you could type in a request and, and get back a resource. So it had, <laughs> so, so we had very simple origins, right? Um, you had this sort of single request model and now it's gotten a little bit more complicated because now we have all these headers. We've got request headers that tell us uh, what the server, it tells the server what it should send us. And we've got response headers, which tell us all this stuff about the stuff that was being sent. And we've got caching, and we've got uh, you know, different content types and all that. Did you, did you happen to notice that about three-fourths of those request headers were cookies? And just in case, in case you didn't know, uh, those cookies are going to be sent on every request you make to the domain that set them whether or not that's an image request, a JavaScript requ request, CSS, whatever. And so if you have one kilobyte of cookies and you make 100 asset requests, you've just forced 100 uh, kilobytes of probably useless data over the wire, which, you know, on a desktop, it may not be a big deal. On a cell phone, it may be really annoying. So this is just one, this is just one request, right? And normally, on average, web pages these, day, do, these days do 112 requests like per page. This is, this is what the internet has told me is true. And so now our job is to, to get this number down, right? So we already, we already talked about headers, so we might as well throw in some browser caching there. Uh, here's a link with a, a really good article about browser caching uh, that, that you may want to look up later. It's on Heroku. And, you know, that's great for the second time that you load the page. But the first time you load the page, you still do 112 requests, which is crazy. So uh, we, have these, we have these best practices now. We, we concatenate our JavaScript and CSS. You know, this is built into Rails. And so we take 40 JavaScript and CSS files in development, and we squeeze them down into, into one or two files. And now we're doing great, right, because we've got we're, we've, we've gone from 100 and something assets, we're down to maybe 30 assets. I mean, I, I do kind of feel dirty about all this because I've just uh, glommed together a bunch of code that doesn't logically go together, and I've, I've made it so that if I change one line in my JavaScript, my user has to download an, an entire, say, 100 kilobyte JavaScript slug again. Uh, but, you know, it's okay. But what I'm really upset about is that, you know, I still have 30 requests. I just, I just can't get any lower than that. And, you know, I was really upset about this, and, and Twilight Sparkle came to me. And she, she, she said, I apparently find this a lot more funny than you guys do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she said, could you do this concurrently? Because you do get six connections per domain, and you do know how to make do domains. I bet you guys know how to make domains, too. And it turns out, yeah, you can. This is a technique called domain sharding. It's used a lot by sites like Flickr, where you have you know, a ton of assets being loaded. Essentially, instead of loading all your assets from one domain, you make 10 subdomains that all point to the same IP address, and you load your assets from them. So instead of uh, six concurrent connections, you get 60. And I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's really an ugly hack uh, because it's not that great to have 60 open TCP connections in your browser, um, especially maybe if you're dealing with a, with a mobile uh, device. But, you know, what the hell? We do it anyway. Um, we do this with CDNs. This is from uh, my own website. It's, it's some requests we make. We, use, we probably use six or eight different domains. Uh, and we buy the CDNs for the geographic distribution, but we get the uh, domain charting for free. So a slightly less hacky uh, way to, to deal with this is to, um, 
is to move requests out of band. These are some, some interesting new, uh, new attributes that you can use uh, in, in, your, in your HTML to tell the browser to, say, prefetch images, to prefetch a web page and, and, and pre-render it. Um, also, maybe also you can tell it to look up DN, DNS records, um, and but but now this is really getting into uh, perceptual optimization. It's really getting into uh, really getting into getting into like DOM and JavaScript stuff. So I'm I'm just going to wrap it up. Network performance. You you want to move your servers closer to your users. So use a CDN. Uh, check your. Uh, Check your server configuration files. Check your network uh, stack settings to make sure that Keep Alive is actually keeping alive. Um, don't use a lot of cookies. And just do what you got to do. Swallow your pride. Concatenate those files. Shard them across domains. Just, yeah, embrace the dark side of the force. But don't worry, because the cavalry is on the way, right? We've got this thing called Speedy. It's uh, designed to be a lot better at this lots of small files problem. Uh, supported by, I think I think the newest versions of all the browsers. Although as usual, like IE really screws it up. The the workaround is to, to disable Speedy. And but you still need CDNs to get uh, the content closer to your users because Speedy doesn't lower the speed of light or anything, and, it's, and it requires SSL, which may be bad for some people. I don't know. And finally, our great hope is HTTP 2.0 which is coming soon, and hopefully within the next couple of years we'll all be uh, using that, and we'll be able to ditch a lot of these, uh, these best practices that are really kind of just workarounds for, for um, the protocol. If, if you want to learn more about this stuff, you should really buy this book, um, High Performance Browser Networking by Ilya Gregoric. Uh, it's available free. I, I just saw that online um, right now, so go check it out. Um, he talks about everything I've talked about here, but in greater depth and more intelligently. And finally, if you have uh, any questions, just like feel free, just come at me, bro. Um, like I'm super friendly. I'm, I'll give you like a big hug, like this little guy. And uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll be around. Um, and that's it. Get the slide deck uh, from my, my Twitters. Is that it? Yes. <laughs>